Good evening, dear guests. We are very happy to greet you at the fourth talk of our cycle, uh, Cultural Leadership Practices and Theory, which we, the British Embassy, the Cultural Department of Aid, organized together with the Garage Museum. I want to say once again thank you uh, to the museum for hosting us. And I don't want to take up too much time. I will just introduce our today's speaker. That's an independent producer, Martin Green, who, apart from the uh, ceremonies for the London Olympic and Paralympic Games, has also or headed the uh, Health Cultural City, Health Cultural Company program. And today, this will be the focus of our today's talk. Martin will tell us how, with using cultural projects, one can reach the local residents, how to find the connection with the people who are normally far from culture. After the talk, as usual, you will have the opportunity to ask any questions you want to, Martin. And please enjoy the talk. Thank you very much. Hi. Yes, that's more like it. Should we try that again? Hi. Good, right. Uh, it's going to be very interactive, this. Okay. Uh, so a couple of things to say, first of all. First of all, thank you for coming out this evening. Uh, I come from London, where if we have this much snow, everything stops. So I'm very impressed uh, that, you've, you, that you've made it here this evening. Uh, the second thing is to apologize that I don't speak Russian. Uh, so I hope that with my wonderful friend in the booth over there, say hi, uh, you'll, you'll be able to get uh, an essence of what I am talking about. So I'm just going to start this up uh, and put it on the right thing and go here and there we will be uh, good if I can just move this here. So. What's going to happen tonight is that I'm going to talk for a little bit and then we're going to have a conversation, okay? So I want you to think about anything that my talk here inspires you to ask and talk about because the most interesting thing here is not me talking, but us talking, okay? Um, and which is another way of saying when it comes to the question and answer session, don't leave me hanging here, okay? Be very vociferous. Um, because I, I'm going to talk about well, it says up there, cities, what I'm interested in, which is uh, cities and the people who live in them and how culture connects those two things together and how we try and find unique voices for cities and how we try and reach beyond the audiences that naturally would come to cultural events and art. And we see art as a real agent for change across every aspect of a city. Uh, but first, let me talk a bit about me, <laughs> uh, just so that we can get to know each other. Um, I am, I guess, the best way to describe myself is a, is a, is a cultural producer. I, I produce arty stuff, uh, generally in cities and on a reasonably large scale. So this picture here uh, was taken 28 minutes after the end of the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games, which I produced. Uh, which is why I look like that, by the way, okay? So the eagle eye amongst you will, will see the tools of the trade. Uh, here is a box of tissues for production meetings because everybody cried all the time uh, because they used to end at three o'clock in the morning and then we used to start again at six o'clock in the morning. Uh, here is a very large roll of toilet paper uh, because if you remember the show, if you saw the show, there were five big rings that came across the sky and all came together. And in the show, on the night, with four billion people watching, that was the first time that had ever worked. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the dress rehearsal, they went up, stopped, and caught on fire. And uh, this is for producers in the room. This is how the conversation went. I went, is that supposed to happen? Uh, and they said, no. And I said, uh, are we insured 
That was my second question. And then only then, my third question was, do you think we ought to put it out? Um, so, and also down here are a load of telephones which connected us to the Civil Aviation Authority where we could stop all air traffic over the stadium, which is quite handy if you want to throw the Queen out of a helicopter halfway through your show. Uh, and if anybody wants to know the story of how you throw a queen out of a helicopter, ask me afterwards or ask me in the pub afterwards, even better, because it gets better the more wine I've had. Uh, so <laughs> it's by way of saying my, my career here, I studied theatre at university, not acting. I'm a terrible actor. I have no talent whatsoever, uh, but I was interested in writing and, and the directing of theatre. And then I got very interested in events in public space and how that brought people together. And I uh, ended up working for the mayor of London uh, called Ken Livingstone at the time. And London had been without a central government for about 20 years since the last central mayor mayoralty was abolished. Uh, and that meant that the 32 boroughs in London had very much kind of done their own thing. And there was a lack of a sense of the whole city coming together. And so what Ken Livingstone wanted to do was very much use culture to celebrate the city as a whole. And that meant really celebrating the diversity of the city. So we brought back big celebrations of Eid and Diwali and St. Patrick's Day, and we supported Gay Pride and really made a statement that the city is for everyone and everybody should have a moment to celebrate their culture. I guess the, 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 the journey there ultimately was for London to stage the Olympic Games because, as Ken Livingstone said, there are 205 countries coming to London and every one of them will find a community here already who speaks their language and prays to their God. Uh, and that was a very important way of describing why London wanted to host the Olympics. I might say that now we're going through the tragedy that is Brexit, that is possibly no longer the case. You'll find I have some strong views on Brexit as we go through here. It's a disaster. Uh, so uh, after working for the mayor for five years, I then went into commercial land and I worked on a new venue in London called the O2, uh, which is a big uh, events arena. Some of you may have heard it and in a way, it was a good preparation for my job to come because I really spent six months with people telling me it would never work and it was a waste of money. And it's still actually the, the most successful arena in the world by ticket sales. Um, and it was during that process that I was approached to become the head of ceremonies for the Olympic Games, which meant that I was in charge of overseeing the opening and closing of the Olympic and Paralympic Games, the two torch relays, uh, the medal ceremonies, uh, of which there are a thousand over 20 venues, and also the welcome ceremonies for each of the 205 countries, which I am really proud still to stand here and say it went quite well. Um, otherwise, I would not be standing here <laughs> at all. <laughs> um, and when you finish um, an Olympics, I think you have two choices. You can join what I would call the Olympic traveling circus, that group of people who go from country to country to country. And I didn't want to do that because I, f I find that for myself a bit soulless. But it's also more importantly about, I think one of the reasons we, were, we managed to make a success of our games is because we were very connected to the place in which we were making them. So it wasn't just a job. You know, and this is the start of the conversation about place and your connection to place. Um, and so I sort of waited around and um, was approached to uh, run the UK City of Culture project in Hull, of which I'm going to talk a lot more in a minute. But first of all, and, and thankfully you're not going to be listening to me talk all night because I'm going to show a lot of videos. Uh, I want to show you a video we made right at the start of that project as a kind of statement of intent. And it's not just about Hull, I think it's about all cities and it's called um, Art Will Bring Us Together.
you're either interested in life and what it means to be human or you're not. And the arts is the way that we do it. So it moves us, it thrills us. You know, not everybody kind of understands or um, learns about the world in a single way. I think that's what the arts do. I think they kind of give you another vehicle to then either, either understand yourself or understand the world or understand your neighbor. And it brings you closer to what sometimes can feel so far away from you. For me, it's kind of like, it's basically, it's just, it releases this everything what's in here and it, it just goes, then it, it's out of me and it's out there. I think arts is most powerful when it isn't art and when it doesn't feel like art and when it, when it isn't anything associated with the word art because the word art has so much baggage with the people that feel that they're not capable of art. So I think the actual moment of art is when you um, are magically moved. We're all, we all have this inherent creativity and art within us. So I think when people say art is not for them, I like to challenge that and I like to find a way to really expose that because fundamentally we're all artists. Everybody has creativity and it's just a question of finding what the channel for that is. got is your authenticity, you've got your viewpoint, you've got your experiences you lived, you hope that there's some sort of fragment in the way that you viewed the world. That's what we're all trying to do is just capture this small moment of how we viewed the world at that point in time and hopefully there's something in it that someone either finds completely absurd and challenging to their own humanity or something that someone relates to which they can then relay into their own experiences. We shouldn't try to provide the answer to everything and I think in some ways actually allowing people to define art for themselves and um, allowing people to take a bit of curatorial control um, and just giving permission for amazing things to happen. Great art can connect you to the place that you're in. It can make you transform the way you view the world and can bring you, I think, essentially would bring you closer to what I can only describe as humanity, a deeper understanding of humanity in, in all its complexity. It's never perfect. And I think sometimes you can get lost in that quest for perfection. Art is better out than in. If it remains in, we don't speak to each other, so it's being expressed and understood as another form of conversation. I think cities are like people. If you are neglected, or overlooked, underestimated, and yet you know that you have this incredible history, you've got all these talents, you need to find some way of breaking through people's perceptions and making something happen where people reassess. Art has the power to help us to tackle some of the very basic problems. We know that there's a lot of social inequality, um, lots of isolation. I used to find it really difficult to talk about Tourette's without tears, Biscuit, Biscuit. And then I had a conversation with um, Biscuit, my friend Matthew, who describes Biscuit, uh, my tics, as a crazy language generating machine and told me that not doing something creative with them was wasteful. Let's get, uh, let's get, and this idea took root. Maybe it's that hunger, I guess. Maybe it's that thing that you just can't seem to turn off. And it's a risk. You're taking a risk, you know. You're taking a risk. OK, I think this is going to work. The thrill in the unknown, and I don't know what to do. I'm in this kind of no man's land of fear. There's no right or wrong way to do it, anybody can do it. It's having that reason to be alive. Art has that ability to make somebody think differently about their world. Every shared laugh or conversation or piece of artwork has the potential to create change. As the world evolves, as politics evolves, as, as relationships evolve, as climates change, as, as everything in this world is all orbiting around or fluctuating, there's never going to be this moment of stillness. It 
its impact on people and its impact on the city uh, is something to be analysed and understood. If this isn't arts and culture, what is? It's about us not telling the community what, well, this is art. That's, it's the other way around. They tell us what art is. And art for them means many, many, many different things. Culture means many, many different things. So I hope that sets the tone uh, a little about what I, I want to talk about. I'm reminded of the definition of culture that I work to, which is that culture is the sum total of all our creativity, uh, which I think stops it being about genres of art and makes it more about how we can come together as human beings and be creative. Um, so let's talk about this project uh, in Hull, a bit of which uh, you saw there. Then there's a big caveat here, which is I will talk about this as if it's the only way to do anything, right? Of course it's not. You must take what is uh, inspirational to you from this and leave what is not, and much of it you may have already done. Um, let's deal with the basics first of all. Where the hell is Hull? Uh, there it is, <laughs> up here in the north of England, uh, on the eastern side, uh, it has a population of about 270,000 people, so it's very small. Uh, and the idea of the UK City of Culture project came out of Liverpool being the European capital of culture in 2008. Um, and that went very well for Liverpool, having a year to express itself. And it's important to remember that Liverpool was in decline before that. Uh, in fact, the government were literally talking about closing it down, right? Managed decline, they called it. Uh, but this year, as the European City of Culture reignited Liverpool. And at the time, we weren't due to have another European capital of culture for about 15 years uh, because of the cycle it works on. Obviously, now we're never going to have another one, okay, which is another tragedy. Uh, <laughs> you see my running theme here. Uh, so uh, the government got together and said, well, okay, why don't we have our own UK City of Culture project every four years? But, and this is the important bit, it, we will design it so that it can only go to cities that need it. So London is banned from bidding and the bigger metropolises uh, aren't allowed to bid either. It is a agent of change. Uh, and this is very important because I think what a lot of countries share is that we've seen the growth of the metropolises. So, you know, in the UK, that's London, Manchester, Liverpool. But a lot of the other cities are left there going, well, what do we do? What are we for? And their instant reaction sometimes is to be, OK, well, we need to be more like London or we need to be more like Liverpool. But of course, that's a redundant thing. Only Liverpool can be Liverpool. Only Moscow can be Moscow. Cities need to find their own voices and their unique reason to be, which is inherent in them. You just need to pull it out. So the first UK city of culture was in Derry, Londonderry, in Northern Ireland. So good they named it twice. Uh, and clearly, there was a whole load of issues that culture can deal with there. And what they used their year for was for culture to create a, um, a safe space where two sets of people with very different ideas about the world could come together and share. They actually literally built a bridge across the city, uh, which is what that bridge is there. Um, and so that began a process of when a city wins this title, it's not about looking what other people did, it's about finding your own way to do it as a city. Now, let's talk about Hull before. This is a book called Crap Towns. I hope that translates. Uh, and in this book called Crap Towns, Hull was the number one crap town. And I know my friend is going to enjoy this in the corner. And they said, come judgment day, the city would be leased out indefinitely to Satan to provide housing for the damned. This was the view of Hull. Now, the problem with that is, you know, it's quite funny. But if you tell a city it is no good, for too long, everybody in that city starts believing that. And you end up in a downward spiral. And Hull 
like most cities, has had its ups and downs. It was very, very rich once because of the fishing industry. It was completely decimated in the Second World War uh, because uh, it was a port and a strategic port. So what they did is they used to bomb the city on the way in uh, because it was a strategic port on the way to London. And on their way back uh, to lighten the planes, in case they had any bombs left, they just let them all off over Hull. So it had a terrible, ter it was flattened. Um, so in 2013, the city really managed to get a grip of itself and say, right, what is our future? And the city realized that there are many parts of what can make a city a success. Industrially, they decided that they would really go for the green energy market because they saw that as a big growth area and the port would be very, very useful. So they bid for and won a 300 million pound Siemens factory making wind turbines for the world. And they also have turned a lot of their industrial port over to the importation of green energy and green fuels. Really importantly, the council then said, well, there's no point in having these jobs if nobody wants to live here. And that was a real issue for the employers in the city, that, that it was a transient city. The young people, for instance, felt that either they had no choice but to stay or no choice but to leave. And that really went on economic lines. Similarly, people would only stay in jobs for a short time because their constant thing was, how can I get out of here? Okay, So they realized that, as well as an industrial plan, they needed a culture plan. Uh, to make the city more livable and more attractive as a place to live, study, work, invest. And that's why they decided to bid for the UK City of Culture project title, uh, which didn't go very well at the start. 65% of residents did not think Hull should be the UK City of Culture. Um, and there's some nice little things, but my favourite was, I've seen more culture in a pot of yoghurt. <laughs> so... The city did a really great social media campaign. That's how they explained why it was good, why it was worth the money they were spending. Uh, and in the end, on the day they entered the bid, 85% of the city supported it bidding for UK City of Culture. And uh, uh, they won the title. So what then ensued was some years of preparation. Uh, the, uh, the city had for a long time talked about redoing its streets, redoing its roads, uh, but finally they had A, an excuse, and B, really importantly, a deadline. And I think this is one of the values of these kind of projects. They give politicians a deadline, because if they're late, it's not my fault, it's their fault. And so they did three years' worth of work in the city in one year. This is what it looked like for most of the time. This is the central square in Hull. Um, so we got busy with that. We also did some test events. Uh, Spencer Tunick came and did one of his famous naked portraits. And it's really important here to say that Hull has always been a cultural city. It just forgot that it was. And there was a lot of talk in the bid of Hull emerging from the shadows or rising like a phoenix. And when I got there, I said, stop. You have to refuse this narrative, right? Don't say, don't apologize. Start up here. We're great. Where the bloody hell have you been, right? Should be the stance that cities take. So when we brought Spencer Tunick in, you know, we wanted 400 people to... Um, volunteer to strip naked, paint themselves blue, uh, and do things like this. Three and a half thousand people volunteered to do this, right? I didn't, I'm far too Victorian, I ran away, right? One of our staff did it with their dad. But anyway, three and a half thousand people came out and did the Sea of Hull, and we knew then we had a taster that the, pe the people wanted this to happen and they wanted to join in. Participatory arts, right? We also brought um, uh, Graciel in with a beautiful show called Place de Sange where about 15 to 20 angels uh, fly above the, the square and dump two tons of white feathers onto an audience of about 15,000 people. That's half the show. The other half of the show is just people playing for hours in two tons of white feathers. And again, it's about participating. It's not being a passive spectator. 
because again, I think this is where you cross the line into really making a difference with people. Um, we uh, did a little bit of building work. Now, we were very wary of, of building new things. Uh, sometimes with these, with these projects, politicians start to build monuments to themselves, right? But we, uh, so instead we refurbished. There was a great old theatre that was desperately in need of refurbishment. Uh, the Ferens Art Gallery was desperately needing refurbishment, so we did that. Um, there was a new kind of funky area of town called the Fruit Market, which was changed into a, an area of bars and restaurants. And you could only open a bar or restaurant there if you were an independent operator. Um, and we, we redid the public realm. So to set the scene, the only thing we really realised the city didn't have was a really good contemporary art space. And so we worked with one of the developers. This was a three-storey old fruit warehouse uh, that we changed into the Humber Street Gallery as a pop-up for the year. But I'm pleased to say it's still there and it's still operating. Um, and then we set about telling the story. And like I said before, it was about finding you know, the, the, the stories of the city. Now, what you find with cities across the world is that they have dominant narratives. So in Hull, it's the fishing industry and the Second World War. Now, those narratives need to be spoken about, but what can also happen is that those narratives can drown out new stories. And they can mostly also drown out the voices of the young because those dominant narratives are held mainly by older people, mainly by men, mainly by white men. And so this is where you get this monoculture. So we wanted to make sure that we could find the other stories this city had. So Basil Kirchin, the godfather of electronic dance music, was from Hull. So we did a festival about him. Lillian Baloka was a woman who campaigned for better safety on ships. And when uh, the ships kept going down and they were losing their men, uh, all the women got together and said, enough. And there was an old myth that if your wife or girlfriend was standing on the dock when the ship departed, you couldn't depart because it was unlucky. So all they simply did is went down to the port and stood there because they knew the ships wouldn't leave. And in the end, the owners of the ships made them safer. Um, so we did a play about her. Uh, the, this is something you might know. The spiders from Mars uh, are from Hull. OK? Yeah, yeah, fun fact, everybody. Uh, and also, we celebrated the work of Coombe Transmissions. Now, Coombe Transmissions are a really out there contemporary art group who were chased out of Hull by the police in the late 1970s. And they went to the ICA in the Mall in London, and they staged a show called Prostitution, which was closed after 24 hours. And in Parliament, they were de decried as wreckers of civilization. Uh, so we, now, so important has their work become that the year before we staged our year, uh, the Tate bought their entire archive. And so we staged their first ever retrospective, which was called Wreckers of Civilization. Uh, and I'll never forget uh, two older ladies writing to me, having witnessed various things being put up people's bottoms in the, in the exhibition and, and saying, we're not prudes, we're widows. I still don't know what that means. Uh, but we opened with that ex uh, exhibition because we wanted to make a statement of intent that this was a modern, forward-thinking, edgy city. Um, we also wanted to talk a lot about culture in the north. Uh, there's various conversations sometimes about regional culture. Uh, and so we created a festival called Substance, which was about culture in the north. Um, but we also wanted to make sure we got the headlines. We also wanted to excite people, so we brought in uh, other projects from around the country. So we staged the Turner Prize, one of the world's greatest contemporary art prizes uh, with the Tate in Hull. We worked with the Royal Shakespeare Company to uh, produce a play called The Hypocrite, which is about the start of the English Civil War, which, by the way, started in Hull. Uh, Radio One's Big Weekend is just a massive pop concert. I mean, it's just vast. And, you know, don't ent underestimate the effect on 50,000 young people of Katy Perry walking on stage and saying, hello, Hull, right? It was a profoundly moving moment because no one like that had ever said anything like that. Uh, and that went on for two days. And we also worked with a lot of architects to do major installations through the city because we found that longer running uh, uh, installations were good for the city because the city wasn't big enough to cope with, you know, a quarter of a million people coming on one night. 
and longer installations gave people reasons to return. I'll talk about that in a minute. We divided the year into four seasons of three months each. Obviously, a year is a long time to get through. We staged about 2,000 events, by the way. Um, and uh, so the first season was called Made in Hull. That pretty much says what it does on the tin. We wanted to talk about the stories from Hull and the people of Hull because we knew that in the first season, if we didn't connect with the people of the city who were suspicious, you know, it's not for me, it's gonna be a whole load of arty people doing arty things, and we had to get over that first of all. So this is a piece called The City Speaks. Down this end of the street was a lectern like this, and if you spoke into it, your words rolled up this structure, which is actually a tidal barrier. Um, and if you want to see real joy, be there on the night I was there where a five-year-old boy discovered that although we'd, we'd had a piece of software which would take out a lot of rude words before it went up there, we didn't take out the word poo. <laughs> and for about 15 minutes, all this thing did was scroll poo up this thing. But you know, the joy of children, right? Uh, and then the second season was called Roots and Roots. Hull is a port city. Two million people came from Northern Europe through Hull to Liverpool on their way to America. Uh, and it's also, it's always been a city of people who have left and people who have arrived. I might also say Hull is a city where 68% of the population voted to leave the European Union, which in terms of the social economics of the city proves that vote was a vote about disenfranchisement and nothing to do with being part or not part of Europe. Um, so we wanted to talk about the sea and the water. Um, we did that, so this was a project called Flood. Hull is the second most likely city in the UK to flood. Um, and this was something I was very proud of. I'd always wanted to do a multi-platform show. So this, this project was 365 days long. Uh, part one was online all year. Part two was live on a floating stage in one of the docks, working with the community around that. Part three was on BBC television. Part four was back on the dock. So it was something that we spread across all platforms and, and just worked really well as an engaging uh, discussion piece. Um, the third season was called Freedom. Uh, Hull is the birthplace of a man called William Wilberforce who ended the slave trade in the UK and particularly the trade that was coming out of, Na of Africa. Um, our twin si city is Sierra Leone, is Freetown in Sierra Leone. Um, and, it, and Hull has always been very proud of the fact that it's quite liberal uh, and welcomes different communities. And I remember the BBC saying to me, uh, you know, if you really want to get national coverage, you need to find an event that is happening that year which is of national concern and claim it for your own. And they cited uh, uh, that there was an anniversary of the First World War going on and that it was the Queen's wedding anniversary. <laughs> now, Hull, as we've said, dominant narratives around war, it really did not need any more projects around war. And Hull is famous when the Queen celebrated her 50th anniversary, every city was invited to put on events and the only city in the entire country that didn't ask was Hull, because <laughs> it's actually quite Republican at heart. Um, but we then realized that 2017 was the 50th anniversary of the legalization of homosexuality in, the, in England and that this was going to turn into a big story. And Hull you know, supports a big community. And so we staged a week of work called LGBT50. Uh, and interestingly, the research showed that we had our biggest audiences from the most deprived areas around Hull. And so you see the, how this connects people above economics. Um, and we had a big tea party in the square where everybody got free cake and we put an ax and we had a big parade and it was lots of fun. And the last uh, season was called Tell the World. Uh, this was about looking forward. It was going to be more technical based. Uh, and we did a project called 2097 We Made Ourselves Over by a company called Blast Theory. And this was about asking everybody in the city to imagine what their city could look like in 80 years time. And Hull still has a lot of phone boxes, old fashioned phone boxes. I know 
you young people are going, what's a phone box, right? But in the olden days, you used to have to go into a box to pick up a phone. Uh, and there are about 300 of these uh, phone boxes in Hull. And on the 31st of October in 2017, at 2 p.m., all of them rang simultaneously. And if you were walking past one and picked up the phone, you spoke to someone from the future. And this was a way of engaging people in a conversation about what would happen. And then invariably, the next thing would happen is a blacked out car would come and pick you up and take you to the future. Here's the trailer. It was an app-based app -based piece of work. And it wasn't just about art, of course, because various things have to work in conjunction here. In order to stage the year, we needed an army of people to help us, so we recruited 2,500 volunteers. And, you know, don't underestimate the cultural impact of volunteering. We had, uh, specifically here, we worked with health providers in the city because they were interested in getting people active. They were interested in social isolation, not only among older people, but younger people as well. And this was a group of people who came together and are still together, actually, because it's a legacy project. So they've been working now for over three years. Uh, and the health impacts on them uh, and, and the way they interact with each other has been absolutely profound. This photograph was actually taken in Edinburgh because we sent several hundred of them to the opening day of the Edinburgh Festival to take over Edinburgh and talk about Hull. <laughs> uh, we ran uh, an education program in, uh, and participation program in all 101 schools in the city. Um, as our learning person says, everybody is born with creativity. You don't have to teach it. You just have to release it from people. Uh, and there is no job in the world that doesn't at its heart require creativity. Um, this is a project called BuzzFeed where what we found is it's very difficult to get young people into galleries and to talk about art but if you take them around an exhibition and you record exactly what they're saying and then you put that into the mouths of puppets which they then operate and film and edit and upload, you suddenly have a holistic way of engaging young people in issues around art. So when we stage the Women of the World Festival which is a global movement, bringing lots and lots of women together from different areas. We sent some of these kids to the Women of the World Festival and, and this is what happened. See, this is really organised, I like this. It's called, oh, wow. what's it about? It's about women of the world. All oh, right. And there's like, it's in different places. What are you laughing at? <laughs> Don't laugh, I'm serious. Just where women go to meet other women. No. So what's it about then, Morgan? Can you no, tell us? It's about women. Do you know that I've like achieved things? Huh. Yeah, it's great. Because then I get to show off what they've done. Yeah. Women are always sad, like men, they can go burst around and stuff, but women, like, they don't really get... Recognition. But, uh, yeah, recognition for what they've done. I'm on my child and somebody like my age but a boy. They're still flicking pieces of plastic about. I always got a fatly solid 14-year-old. Like, doctors and things like that, you can still aspire to be a doctor. I'm not going to be a doctor, I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm to a dentist. And then everyone in year nine are like, no, you won't be it. But wait until I am, I'm going to send them down first. Wow. <laughs> no, you meant it's about the women of the world. Wow. No, not... Wow. Wow! Wow! Yeah, good. Go on then, you take that. Wow! 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 
So we're trying to breed a whole new generation of feminists there. Um, right on. Uh, obviously a big community engagement programme, and I'll talk about that in a bit. So just take you through a few of the decisions we made. Clearly we needed to open the year. And when people talk about openings, they tend to talk about something that happens on one night where you invite all the sponsors and all the important people. And actually the people you want to work with don't get to get in. So we turned our opening into a seven night affair where we projected in about 11 spaces across the city, stories of the city. Yes, stories of the war and stories of fishing, but other stories too, because this was a way of saying, right, we've spoken about that now. But importantly, we posted an invitation to this event through every single front door in the city which was a really important moment because what we were saying is you have been invited. You may choose not to come, but you have been invited. And what happened was on the first night, we thought about 100,000 people would come over the week. So on the first night, the culturally engaged came. On the second night, their friends who were a bit dubious. On the third night, they told people it's okay, it's not arty, it's really good fun, and so on and so on. In the end, 343,000 people came to this event. And on the last night, 103,000 people turned up, which nearly broke us. Uh, but I think it taught us a lot about the generosity of spirit as art makers that you need if you're going to take a whole city and a population on a journey for a year. Um, immediately after this, we staged a project called Blade. Now, I talked about the wind turbine factory. This object is 72 meters long, and it is the largest single piece handmade object in the world. All these blades are handmade, and what they do is they have a hundred of them in the car park and they put lasers over them, and the three that are most alike go on a turbine in the sea. Um, and of course, this object, therefore, is made by the hands of the men and women of Hull, and it is an art object, and that's what the artist Nayan Kukan said, and he wanted to put this object in the middle of the town square, and additionally, he wanted it to be a surprise. Now, over six months, 200 people worked on this project from transport planners to engineers to events people, and no one told anyone what they were doing. We had to remove 13 sets of traffic lights, 17 lamp posts, and we did it in the dead of night. And the city did wake up to find that this object had been placed here, and it was up for about 10 weeks, um, celebrating the story of the city. Uh, Hull has some of the biggest social housing in Europe uh, and we worked with a number of tower blocks simply with everybody in them to gel the lights outside their flats, colours appertaining to the maritime communication system of flags. And it was called I Wish to Communicate With You. And of course the headline in the paper the next day was I spoke to my neighbour for the first time. The Land of Green Ginger was probably our most ambitious prog program. We got seven sets of artists to go into the seven boroughs of Hull for two years with one instruction, make acts of magic and wonder. And what they did first of all is that they drew the stories out of the people in those communities uh, through different devices. So one company had a big hairy monster massive hairy monster that every day for a few weeks would go out and just attach itself to someone and spend the rest of the day with them. So on one day it ha happened to attach itself to a, to a bank manager, just followed it around, sat next to it. Uh, on another day it, it attached itself to a school child and it was mute, it didn't say anything. And what we found was that if there is a big hairy mute monster in front of you, you tend to just tell it stuff you wouldn't tell anyone else, right? Another artist took over a disused shop in a very rundown area of Hull, painted the door gold, and put a sign outside saying, dare you walk through the door. And if you did, you found four drag queens who gave you a cup of tea and sat down and had a chat with you. And these were all devices to draw stories out. So one of the stories they found is in Hull there are terrace houses 
that back onto each other and the alleyway behind them is called a 10 foot because it's 10 foot wide. It's called a 10 foot. And there's a myth in East Hull that one of these 10 foots only appears at midnight for three hours. And if you walk down it, magical things happen. So that's what we did. We made that appear at midnight over the period of weeks where people could walk down it. And of course, this was about children asking granddad, tell me about this myth, granddad to saying where it came from. So all these conversations about the stories of the city, you know, got going. Um, and this is uh, one we did on an estate uh, called the Long Hill Burn, where we asked residents of, a, of an estate to write down their hopes for the future. The hopes were then put in a box. The box was paraded by the whole community to a bonfire. The box was hauled up to the top of the bonfire and it was set alight. And when the flames reached the hopes, they turned into fireworks and we played lovers in the air. So these are very, very simple mechanisms. But this was one of the most profoundly moving things I've ever been to. Right. Um, and then finally, uh, where do we go from here was our last thing where we took a load of robotic car arms out of a defunct factory and we attached lights to them and we placed them across the city and some of them had mirrors and some of them had lights and they passed and shared light to each other. So half of it was just a really interesting installation in the city. But the other half of it is we trained all the volunteers to have conversations with everybody who came to it about, at the end of our year, possibly the most important question of all. Where do we go from here? Because these things can't be just about one year. Now, this is less interesting, this stuff, but I will whip through it. So obviously we did a whole load of research through the University of Hull on this. And we looked at arts and culture, placemaking, the economy, obviously, society and well-being and partnerships. And, you know, just a few of the highlights. Nine over, nine out of ten residents went to at least one thing. So out of an entire 270,000 population, and that for the UK is an extraordinary amount of engagement. Um, if you went to the theatre, 38% of the people who booked to go to Hull Truck Theatre were first-time visitors to the theatre. And really importantly, for every one event my organisation delivered as the lead organisation, the city put on a further three. Because it would have been really dangerous if we were the only people producing work. Because we knew we would have to stop and we wanted to leave a better capacity built arts organisations there. And that's what happened. Of the 1.1 million people who walked past Blade, uh, 420,000 of them interacted with it. And of those 420,000, half of them said it was their reason to come to the city that day. So if you simply take 210,000 people and times it by one cup of coffee, you've got the beginning of your economic argument for art. I don't like having to make an economic argument for art, right? Because art brings people together, but sometimes you have to, and we were able to do that. Um, in terms of place, Hull was already an inherently proud place, but we saw uplifts in the way that people spoke positively about their city and importantly to other people. Because Hull was a place where um, I, I live in Hull and I can uh, say bad things about my city, but you can't, <laughs> right? And we saw a shift in that. Also, all Hull ever saw was bad things about them in the newspapers. And for a year, they only saw great things about them. And apart from all these statistics and everything that I can put behind this, the most simple way to describe to you what happened in this city was that an entire city put their shoulders back and put their head up. It was as simple as that. And Confident cities are proud cities, proud cities are confident cities, and confident cities can do anything they want. So, you know, awareness of uh, the project through the whole of the UK, you know, went through the roof. We had a very good marketing and PR program, by the way. I'm a huge believer in marketing and PR. I think it's art, just like anything else. And so we didn't do that classic thing of raiding the marketing budget to pay for the art and then wonder why no one was coming to see the art, right? Um, and in terms of the economy, we saw 
uh, uplifts, obviously, in the amount of stays and the visitor stays. And if you want one statistic of all, visitorship to the gallery went up 500%. Um, so what happens now? Because you can have a year like that, and if it falls off a cliff, you know, you're in trouble. So it was very important we got the legacy plan now. I hope that word legacy translates. You know, the UK is very obsessed with this. Yes, we will put money into big events, but we want to know what happens afterwards. And for actually, for some people, they only care about what happens afterwards, and I, I think that's wrong. Um, the Scandinavians don't call it legacy, they call it impact, which I think is a much better, a, a much better word. And we made sure that this was a collective act because the other problem with legacy is that because it's so difficult, everybody goes, it's your job, and then runs away as fast as they can. Um, so we made sure that everybody had a role to play. So the organisation that we started to deliver the year still uh, carries on in Hull. They're just about to produce a, a huge citywide event at the beginning of December. Um, we also have new events uh, coming to the city. We also created some events in 2017 which will now carry on. There's a spoken word festival called Contain Strong Language which has just had its second year. Uh, continuing to work with the neighbourhoods uh, and with communities uh, and also working with young theatre groups. Hull is producing quite a lot of young theatre groups and so we've funded a independent producer to work with them to make sure they can get their work seen. Uh, and the gallery still goes on. So, you know, it will take many years uh, to, I'm gonna wait through, it will take many years uh, to prove the value of this, but the, the opening signs are uh, good and clear. So, hopefully, that's given you an insight to why we made some of the decisions we had on this particular project and also about what I see as the value for art in cities and connecting with people. And so we don't finish on me talking. Obviously, we put together a nice end of year video and it's quite fun to show that. So if you want a flavour of the whole year uh, and how it, how it went down, you know, take a look at this. Or this.
and thank you. Thanks for listening. Большое спасибо, Мартин. Большое спасибо. Thank you very much for your attention. We have some time uh, to ask questions to Martin. If you want to ask a question, please raise your hand and we'll bring you the mic. The only thing, please ask your questions into the mic so that the interpreter could hear what you say. Isn't it great? What do we do with this afterwards? Martin, hi. Hi. Oh. So I got a question. <laughs> it was absolutely amazing project. I am really impressed about that. I mean, how? But it's unfortunately, but it's absolutely impossible in Russia. I mean, just I can't never, imagine. Never, <laughs> never. I just can't <laughs> imagine any small Russian city that would be like that would stage this film. No, like Perm, it, it failed because they wanted to build contemporary art museum, but there's nothing. Uh, everything happens in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Um, and I understand that the similar project, it requires lots of investment. So my question is kind of pragmatic. Who was the investors? Was it some private corporations or the governments of, of Hull? So how did you manage all that yeah. costly uh, activities? Okay, and I know there's some people who don't agree with your premise there, and I want to hear from you later. But um, yes, there are two things. So on the money, let's deal with the money. It costs 32 and a half half million pounds to stage that year. 60% of the money came from public sources. Uh, we're very lucky, and I don't know if it's the same here, that the lottery is, is, you can claim lots of money from the lottery. We have obviously a very good arts council. I also have to say that the British council uh, invested here. I must pay back time for me. Uh, they bought my soul. Uh, and, uh, um, and then 40% of it came from commercial sponsorship, which is very, very hard work still in the UK to get commercial people to give you money for art. Um, I think probably the, the better way to talk about it is you're absolutely right. For cities to make that kind of investment, and actually Hull City only put three million pounds in of that 32 and a half. So for the city, it wasn't a, that big an investment. Um, you do need leadership. Right. So in the first instance, we needed leadership that said, let's not wait 15 years to have a European capital of culture again. Let's have a four year program because we can believe, you know, we can see the power of culture in cities. And also, I think somewhere in cities, you need leadership. Hull had a great elected leader who was very behind it. And you can see kind of in Liverpool and Manchester, it was all about individuals saying, I think culture matters now. You can do it from that end or you can do it from this end. You know, you, the artists really can get together and, you know, begin to do things for themselves, as happens here, you know. Um, so there are, a, there are a certain set of, uh, of circumstances. I think it's about making the case. And you have to be a chameleon because you have to sit in front of people and say, who do I need to be to get you to do what I want? So... If you, if you need me to be the businessman and give you the economics of this, I will give you the economics. If you are a health provider and you want me to tell you how people will be healthier because of this, then I will do this. If you're a tourism leader and you want me to, you know, so I think it's about making the case. And of course, this is, you know, a rather extreme end of it. You know, it doesn't have to be. And like, that's why I say at the beginning, just take or leave whatever. This is something that happened that was reasonably interesting. Is there any value here? Um, so that's the kind of lie of the land, if you but like. Do you know who initiated this project? I mean, was it a it gov was the government. government? It was the government, but led by a guy called Phil Redmond, who is a big TV producer in the UK, who was the chair of Liverpool 08. And he went to the government, and man, he is an insistent man. Now, don't forget, we, we have huge issues in the UK with the funding of art. It's not enough. They keep cutting it. Uh, at the moment, we have a terrible party in, uh, in power who, as well as trying to rip our nation apart, are also, they, they just don't really believe in the arts. Sometimes there are good things. Last week, the health minister said we should start prescribing art on the NHS which for those of us who have banged on about this for years and years and years, that art is better and cheaper than a pill, 
uh, was amazing. Whether it comes through, we'll, we'll wait to see. So we, there are challenges always there. Anybody else? <laughs> Hi, thank you for, uh, uh, for the story. My question is, what kind of criticism did you met while working on this project, and which kind of criticism was fair, and which one was unfair? It was all totally unfair. <laughs> I'm right all the time. Uh, <laughs> you have met me, right? Uh, okay. The arts community in the city were incredibly suspicious of the whole thing. Um, particularly when I, as an outsider from that city, was appointed to run it. Uh, and I don't blame them, right? Um, but we spent a lot of time absolutely talking to the arts community to assure them that this wasn't, this was going to be about them, it was going to draw from them. Um, very simple things like you know, I moved there, and we had an absolute rule. I think about 60% of our staff were from Hull, but if you weren't from Hull, you had to come and live in Hull because I've seen too many people like me sort of arrive on a Monday morning and leave on a Thursday night, and that's just not on, you know. So that took a long time. Also, within the arts community in places like Hull, you'll find that the loudest voices are not necessarily from the best artists. And you find that a lot of them are older white men who just seem to be louder than everybody else. And it took a while to understand where the great art was being made. You will always have that argument, why are you spending this money on this and not hospitals? And that's a perennial argument. And I think part of the research we commissioned wanted to make the case that this was good across the city. Um, and now I think we have a bit of distance from it. I can see, I think, where we could have done better. I think we had a huge, we never really successfully engaged the students of the city. Um, Hull has a big university. And it was just really, really difficult to get them engaged in anything. And I think that's partly because in the UK they have to pay for their courses now and they're so worried about you know, the money they're spending and they've just got their heads down and studying or when they're not, they sort of just want to go to the pub. But we, we really couldn't get them at all. Um, and I think we didn't do as much as work as we should have with, um, with disabled artists. I think, I think that was something that kept getting away from us in the whole largeness of it. So, you know, there, were, there was a lot of criticism and... and you know, these projects aren't perfect, and for every, you know, one person who's going to react to it well, there's always going to be someone who just doesn't see the point. And I guess, personally, what I learned is you, 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 you can't be affected by that, otherwise the majority, you know, will suffer because of it. Um, but in no way do I imagine that it was perfect. Does that sort of answer your question? It's two here. Hello, good evening. Good evening. How much time was the preliminary period of this project? How much time did you prepare for it? How many people do you have on your staff and are going to turn it into a franchise? <laughs> uh, so the staff we had, we had about 100 uh, full-time staff and about another 50 freelancers. Don't forget, we never thought we would be this big. In the bid, we were asked to raise 13 million pounds. Um, but I just had this extraordinary fundraising team who managed to surpass that. So it was ne it, we never thought it would get that big. But in the end, that's, that's what we had. I started work, so it's on a four year cycle and you, the, the, the city, the new city gets nominated whilst the other city is in action. So Hull got announced in 2013. Now, fortunately, the, the council said there is no way we can run this within the council because we don't have the expertise. Let's set up an independent organisation to run it, which was quite unusual for a council, but good. But that took them a year. So I, I started work in October of 2014. 16. So two and a bit, two and a half years, let's call it two and a half years before we went live. Um, and so that was the preparation period. Although having said that, of course, because it's a year, 
by the time you get to the beginning of the year, you've kind of sorted out the first three months. You have an idea of the next three months and you have no idea what, you know. Um, so you're constantly working through the year. Um, but yeah, about, about two and a half years was, was the lead in to it. There was another question, was there staff? Oh, no, I'm not. No, I have a, I, I personally, I have a thing, never do the same thing twice, because I think what you do is you, you go to the same thing and you go, oh, when we did this last time and everybody dies of boredom. And uh, I think, I think great projects require fresh eyes. So, you know, one Olympics was enough for me. One city of culture is enough for me. I'm currently looking for the next thing I can ruin. Uh, so, you know, but that's, that's a personal thing. <laughs> and spreading the word, of course. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. Um, I endlessly respect you, uh, both for setting up the uh, opening and closing ceremonies for the Olympics and the whole story. And I was watching you speaking and I was thinking how you alone, well, of course, with a hundred people, but how you... Um, I can't do anything without a hundred people. Could yeah. manage that. Say... Um, maybe you could tell us what did you start from, let's say, the next morning after you accepted the offer? <laughs> what were you thinking about? To kind of three well, things to set up first. Yeah, I mean, or? it's interesting because I seem to have found myself in this quite specific mode of working because it was the same with the Olympics. You know, I got the job on the Olympics. You turn up to work day one. There is an acre of empty desks. And someone going, right, you have to do this, 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 this. And it was the same in Hull. I arrived on my first day. We didn't have an office. I was borrowing a desk. I had my own phone. And you go, <laughs> right? My nan used to say to me, how do you eat an elephant? And the answer is bit by bit. And really boringly, you just break it down and you go, right, what do we need to do first to get there to there to there? So, uh, you know, on the Olympics, it was right, OK, actually, it's not the ceremonies we need to get going on first. It's the torch relays because they happen 70 days before the Olympics and it's arguably bigger. And so starting to piece that across in Hull, we didn't even have a company. So we had to, you know, the first appointment was a lawyer because we needed to set up a company. We couldn't pay anyone you know, or, or receive payment, right? So in Hull, there was a lot of pragmatics to sort out before we even started uh, looking at the art. Um, but I know that ultimately, the secret to both of them was begging and cajoling and convincing people to come and work on it. Now that was relative, well, with an Olympics, I started the Olympics five years before, and, and in those days, you can't get arrested because everybody thinks it will be late, it will be over budget, and it will be rubbish. And this is how you're trying to hire people, right? As it moves on, it, it does get easier because it is an Olympics. It's the biggest thing in our game, you know, some of us will ever do. So it's slightly easier. And you're in London. You know, we were in Hull, right? And I was lucky that I managed to convince a couple of people who had worked with me on the Olympics to come with me. Obviously, we had people in Hull that we could employ, but you know, cities like Hull don't tend to put on major events every day. So you are bringing in new talent. The, 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 the job is to make sure that you're working with a Hull-based workforce as well. So you're sharing knowledge because that's legacy. You know? um, so it is about hiring great people. And you know, for myself, it's about you know, being very, very open to ideas as you share, you know, although if you spoke to people who work with me, they probably wouldn't say, listen to everybody's point of view and then do it your way, I think. Um, so I think it's a very pragmatic start, breaking it down, looking at the calendar, what do I need to do by when, and then really adhering to that clock, right? Because if you let it slip, and this was a conversation we had with a lot of our stakeholders, the government, say, you know, this train will not stop moving. So every time we need a decision from you, we will say we need this, and you have four weeks to do, to do that. If you don't do it, we will carry on, because we will not let you slow this train down. 
And that's quite a tough conversation to have with people who are you know, far beyond your pay grade and quite important. But I think in both the projects, the Olympics and Hull, getting everybody to realize that the biggest enemy was time, you know, because you cannot be late. There's one over there. Thank you very much for your talk. It was very inspiring. My question is the following. Maybe you could tell us about the most complicated, the most awkward situation that you had while preparing the year or while running it, and how did you deal with it? Another question. How do you manage to carry on for such long term, right? So not to leave it and to do it till the end. How do you manage? <laughs> <laughs> Marlborough lights and gin. Um, I, look, I, it, I never really noticed the time. I, I'm one of those really, really lucky people who gets paid to do what he loves. Right. It is extraordinary to me still that people give me money for doing this. Right. I love it. I believe in art. I think that art can change the world. And as long as I'm doing that every day, I will do it, you know, for years and years. I think the resilience of the team on, on Hull, as, as in the Olympics, took some testing because, you know, it doesn't matter how many people you've got, it's never enough. And I think the year, I mean, I said earlier that we were trying to kind of have the first three months planned, think about the next three and not worry. Actually, that's a lie because actually we were thinking about everything all the time. And the only thing that made a difference was the passing of each day. Um, and that meant that by April, the team basically fell over. Um, you know, we had a lot of people who were just exhausted. Um, because, and, and many of you will know this, if you work on festivals, you're used to a rhythm which is kind of work, two-week festival, no sleep, doing the stuff, partying, end of festival, <laughs> right? Uh, only our festival, our festival was 52 weeks long, but the trouble is everybody was acting as if it was two weeks. Um, so we had to take a step back and really, really, so yes, we took some money out of stuff we were going to do and we employed more staff. We asked ourselves if we were taking care of our stuff. Really simple things like we started fruit deliveries every day because we realized that part of the problem was everybody was eating crap, <laughs> right? So we had fruit and healthy stuff delivered every day. We started a weekly yoga class. I mean, it was sensationally popular. And they used to come out of it like, um, and also we did this thing, and this, I don't know if you've tried this, we had no meetings Fridays, right? It's a really good thing. You are not allowed to plan any external meetings on a Friday. What you actually have to do and end up doing is talking to your colleagues. And, it, and, and as long as everybody adheres to it, it's a really, really good thing. So the time thing is, you know, there's, there's things to worry about, but also because you look up from your desk and you love it, and ultimately, you know, it's just so much fun. Right. I mean, difficult stuff I could go on, you know, forever about because it's all difficult. You know, putting a 72 meter blade in a, in a place where it is simply not supposed to go um, was, you know, just a feat of engineering. And then the artist said, don't tell anyone. <laughs> so if this thing's going past, you go, nothing to see here. Um, and. You know, I mean, I think if you look at the Olympics, you know, we, one of the stage managers said, it's just like a theatre show. There's an audience and a stage. It's just that you have 70 stage managers instead of seven, and you need a bicycle to get across the stage. But it's not. You know, we had a cast of 15,000 people. We would run a 10-minute segment of the show, and it would take an hour and a half to reset it, right? Um, and I remember it, you know, it wasn't long before the show that the first sequence where we whipped up the grass and the chimneys came up it was, was a nine minute sequence. And we ran it in the stadium for one of the first times and it went on for 36 minutes. And our big problem was that if we didn't finish that show on time, no one could get home. And that meant that the next day the papers would not be Olympics opened. It would be transport disaster at opening of, because this is what the British press are like, right? Um, 
And so those things you just have to, you know, work and work and work and work at. But it's, it's cliche, isn't it? If it's not difficult, then it's probably not going to be any good. Really. Okay, one more over there. No, I can stare all night. You can't. I can. So oh, and when are we going to the pub? <laughs> Do you have any cities when, where you really want to work in? So, like, you're dreaming about this. The cities when you're like, oh, my God, I want to work in Shanghai or something like that. <laughs> Because if anybody who knew me was here, they know the answer to this. I want the UK to win the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> Because the one gig that I would love to do is I would love to put that on. It's never going to happen. Uh, but <laughs> there is so... I, I, I apologise. I'm in learned company, but I would love to do that. Um, uh, I, I, think, I think, you know, clearly... Yes, I, think I, always want, I always wanted to work on an Olympics and do an Olympic ceremony. I, I, when I was young, here's a... When I was young, I, I built uh, stadiums out of my Lego. And I used to make opening ceremonies with all my Lego men. And I used to get my, my torch and I used to steal my brother's torches. And I used to light the whole thing, right? So this was, I was like a psychopath on the Olympics. It was like everything I've always wanted to do. And I think that's after that, because you've kind of done it, you, you then really turn around and go, well, what can I do with what I have? I've had this extraordinary experience. And... Going to Hull seemed exactly the right thing to do, that you take everything that you have learned in a capital city with all the resources that a capital city has and you take it to a city that arguably needs it more. And, I, and that was my first time working out of London and I learned an enormous amount about what it is like to be somewhere else and not in a metropolis. And, and I certainly feel a better person for it. Um, and so that's what my interest has become. Now, having said that, you know, I, I'm very lucky. You know, I'm, I'm working in Dubai on the Expo. I'm working on the Tokyo Games. Their ceremonies there, and I'm producing Hogmanay in Scotland this year. So, you know, I get to do some really fun stuff. But I think once you once I did the games, it allowed me to think about not what I'd like to do, but what's important. And to me, this thing about cities and people and place and the way that art works with people's lives for the better has become a real you know obsession and particularly more interesting in this intersection of art and health and how art is great for mental health and social isolation and uh you know just generally making people feel better about themselves because i'm convinced that and we all know this anyway i'm te preaching to the converted here you know art, art is the answer it's absolutely the answer to everything. And what we need to do is never be embarrassed to say that. Because this is the other thing. We're sort of almost put in a position where in well, you know, I think art's the answer. No, art is the answer. Art will bring us together, it will make us healthier, it will make us happier, it will stop wars, it will stop grown-ups making idiotic choices. Art will do that, right? And we need to bang on about that. I've oh, stopped now. But. Okay, listen, can I, can I, before I finish, Can I, uh, can, I thank, can I thank the British Council for bringing me here? It's my first time in Ru Russia my f and obviously my first time in Moscow. It's been already an amazing experience and I'm absolutely loving it. Um, to the technical team at the garage who've made sure everything worked, thank you very much. Uh, Nadia, the translator in there, who's been brilliant. I hope it's been okay. Uh, and also to Margarita, the signer down here. So, can, so thank them and thank you very much for coming.